continue our series on art confronts the isms today art confronts nationalism we should begin i think defining the term what does nationalism mean and more significantly what does it mean to you now growing up in the shenandoah valley of virginia i always thought nationalism was a good thing in fact, it was better than good. It was one of the higher values anyone should have. Unless, of course, you were a citizen of the former Soviet Union. In that context, I guess nationalism was something bad. <laughs> so when I was a kid, context was key. I had to scour many, many websites in my research to get a sense of the current use of the word. In the media, currently, nationalism tends to have a negative connotation. It is often used with other descriptive terms like white Christian nationalism. I think nearly all of us in this community think white Christian nationalism is bad for our country. But what if we strip the term nationalism from these qualifying adjectives and just look at it the way dictionaries define it? The Oxford Language Dictionary defines nationalism as identification with one's own nation and support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. It's that last part of the definition that I think many of us think of when we hear that term today. Let me say it again. Especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. Well, there's something else about nationalism, as the term is often used, that strikes me and maybe it strikes you. It's being used to refer to a way of thinking about one's country that often includes a sense of a glorious past when a nation was seen as essentially ethnically homogenous. It sometimes, in that vein, has a kind of anti-immigrant spirit. Ah, remember this lovely painting from a previous presentation? I have a relative, and I want to point out, make this very clear, a relative by marriage only, who once told me that today's United States is not the true United States. The true United States was something that existed in the first half of the 19th century. And that was the United States we needed to recover in this country. I recall also hearing a politician running for a national office not too long ago, discussing the true America as not the people who live in cities, but people who live in the rural heartland. That was the true America. But statistics show that around 83% of the US population lives in urban areas. So the real America, according to this politician, is represented by 17% of the population. I point this out because it's important for us to understand that nationalism isn't a simple thing when we hear people talking about it. It can mean different things to different people. And it can mean different things in particular contexts of time and place, particularly in the context of politics. Now, I don't want to sit and put the spotlight entirely on my own country, the United States. So let's put the spotlight somewhere else, shall we? <laughs> oh, say Europe. Now, I am a Francophile, love France. Yet much of modern European nationalism owes its legacy to this man, Napoleon Bonaparte. The painter, Jacques-Louis David, was an ardent nationalist. He was originally a major supporter of Robespierre and the French Revolution, and then later Napoleon. Look at how Napoleon is depicted. Doesn't he inspire pride as he's depicted here? inspiration. So what if he's an egomaniac who wants to rule the entire continent of Europe as well as Russia? I'm sure the average French citizen looking at this painting in the early 19th century may have felt a warm swelling in their chest. 
Now here's a work that was originally installed in a church. Imagine that, the state utilizing the influence of religion to further its agenda. It was painted during the European revolutions of 1848 that spread over the continent. Let's take a moment to look at its symbols. The bottom left, there's an unfettered shackle. While shackles are a symbol of restriction or enslavement, unfettered shackles are a symbol of freedom, independence, or a new beginning. This is most likely a reference to the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte after his conquest of Europe. His defeat sparked a European-wide wave of nationalistic sentiment. Now look at the colors on that flag, the prominent black, red, and gold, which is still in use as the flag of Germany. The woman is brandishing a sword. In this figure, the sword is brandished and held upright in a gesture of leadership, and get this, leadership and defense rather than offense or attack. Nobility justice and truth are represented. She also wears a breastplate with an eagle, which symbolizes strength. She has a crown of oak leaves representing heroism. And there is an olive branch around the sword, a willingness to make peace. And then rays of sun coming from behind her, symbolizing the beginning of a new era. Now, who among us could dispute such lofty ideals? Go ahead and replace that flag with any other flag. Anything not admirable about what this painting represents? Well, now let's look at a few artists who began as ardent nationalists for their country, but later modified their understanding of what being a nationalist meant. The first artist I'd like to introduce you to is the German Otto Dix. Here we see a young, rather serious chap. He's only 21, but as you can see by his expression, he is highly ambitious and self-confident in, in his abilities, his intellect, perhaps. In 1914, Otto Dix joined the German army. He joined because he was a patriot an enthusiastic nationalist. Just two years later, he was gunning down British soldiers at the Battle of the Somme. But as we will see, the war did not reinforce his optimism and faith in the German nation, nor its leadership. The war dramatically altered his spirit of nationalism, not killing it, mind you, he still loved his country, but now loved it enough to critique it rather than unconditionally support it. Three war veterans are grossly disfigured. The man on the left is missing his right arm and has a prosthetic left arm. He must play cards with his foot. He's missing his right eye and his face has been mutilated. He has a blue hearing tube attached to what is left of his right ear. The other two men have prosthetic lower jaws and other horrible wounds to their faces. The man in the middle has no arms and artificial legs. And the man on the right has no legs, a prosthetic right arm and no nose. With what is left of their crippled bodies and traumatized minds, these veterans enjoy about all that is left for them to enjoy, a simple card game called scat. I think this work makes clear that not only had war killed and wounded the German people physically, but psychologically and spiritually, and in many of them, killed their idealism about the nation's motives in going to war. Six years after the war ended, Otto Dix honed his drawing skills in a series titled simply Der Krieg, or in English, The War. He was very matter of fact about what he had seen and thus depicted. 
Some of them rather benign images, such as playing cards in a foxhole. I'm not sure I'd want to go have a drink with either of these men. But some of the truth that he depicted in his art was disturbing. Or even horrifying to the patriotic, nationalistic German citizens so excitedly supportive of the war, at least at the beginning. His depictions were raw and brutal because the war had been that way. I believe it was this faithful rendering of his experience that began a change in his own perspective on war and so also in his perspective of his country when it would go to war again at the end of the 1930s. How far would his allegiance to Germany go when it called for violent aggression toward other countries and toward some of its own citizens? In 1932, when the Nazi party had swayed a majority of patriotic Germans to, to, to support them unconditionally, Dix created this triptych. On the left is a rather normal scene of marching soldiers. At the bottom, a row of soldiers who are either very much asleep or dead. In the middle and right panel, things get really interesting. Normally in a triptych you would find in a church, the middle panel shows the crucified Christ. In this work, we have an impaled skeleton. The bony finger of the skeleton points simultaneously to a nearby uh, upside down war victim whose body is perforated with bullet holes, but it also simultaneously points to a distant crater and barren landscape, as if warning us about where war will ultimately lead us, all of us. Germans, French, British, and everyone else involved in war. It is also a warning for the present Germany, since the Nazis have begun their saber rattling towards the rest of Europe. This is a very post-apocalyptic scene. In the right panel, we see Dix himself carrying a wounded soldier. And there is a charred tree trunk crossing the panel behind him. I can't help but think of the image of Christ being lowered from the cross, but this time the Christ is the wounded soldier. No surprise that a year after this painting was completed, the Nazis forced Otto Dix from his teaching post at the Dresden Academy. And four years later, he was one of the artists included in the infamous degenerate art exhibit the Nazis organized in Munich, an exhibit which sought to shame and defame artists who were thought to, to undermine the agenda of the German government. Just like Otto Dix, fellow German Max Beckmann gladly enlisted in the German army during the First World War. He believed war could cleanse the individual, that war could revitalize society. And like Dix, his experience of the horrors of war dramatically changed his perspective. Just after the war, Beckman painted this work titled The Night. Three men have invaded a makeshift home and are assaulting the family who live there. This is in your face, chaos and violence, magnified Waverly, by the artist's use of color and form. Waverly, your share screen went away. We're not seeing your presentation anymore. Don't know how that happened. Let's see. Okay, how are we now? Can you see it? 
Yes, perfect. Okay, did you uh, see this when I began talking? It wasn't up when you began talking, no. Okay, you saw this, right? No. Okay, this is the my introductory slide for Max Beckman, a fellow German as well. And then this was a major work of his that he completed just at the end of the war and right afterwards. So if you look at it, they're just tones of brown and vibrant shades of red. And there are very sharp angles used to depict the characters. Artists like Otto Dix and Max Beckman, though they eagerly went to fight for the motherland, became sensitized through war to the suffering, not only of fellow German soldiers, but the suffering that war causes all who are involved. These artists also became sensitized to what war does to the character of their fellow Germans, who they saw becoming monsters before their eyes. Go back. In this work begun in 1937, when Beckman had fled Germany for Amsterdam, orange birds slash humans with knives. Surrounding the birds are collaborators offering the Heil Hitler salute. So it's an allegory of Nazi rule and the atrocities they were committing. The data was begun is significant because in July of 1937, Hitler had launched an attack on avant-garde artists, threatening them with imprisonment and even castration. Beckman is still a nationalist of sorts because he still believes in the decency of your average German citizen. Take a look at the small table at the bottom of the painting. It's a green table. These German victims of the Nazis enjoyed learning, symbolized by a book, were full of charity, symbolized by a plate of grapes, and were rather enlightened symbolized by a candle. Like Otto Dix, Beckman also had the honor of being one of the featured artists in the Nazis' degenerate art exhibit. For another Austrian artist, well, an artist who gave up on his artistic calling, war had the opposite effect. War for this soldier was like a fuel that catalyzed an uber charismatic demonizer of non Aryans. In the photograph on the left, the skinny fella on the right is Adolf Hitler. This image is from a hospital where Hitler stayed in the fall of 1918, just before the end of the war. He had been blinded by a mustard gas attack from the British. A pastor had come to the hospital and informed the bedridden Hitler that Germany had lost the war. Hitler later wrote, quote, when I was confined to bed, the idea came to me that I would liberate Germany, that I would make it great. I knew immediately that it would be realized, unquote. Now, Hitler is expressing his fervent nationalism. Anything wrong with that? Well, the difference between Hitler and the artists I just mentioned is that war had awakened in the artists a sensitivity to the suffering of all humanity. War had awakened in Hitler a sensitivity to only one type of humanity, the German humanity. And even a narrower version of that German humanity, the German supposedly descended from a once pure Aryan race. That ideology is reflected in his rendering of a common Christian theme on the right. Not exactly a Jewish looking Mary and Christ child, much less Middle Eastern Mary and Christ child. Largely as a result of his experience during the war, Hitler would grow to despise the Christian religion because he felt its values had made Germany weak. The last artist I want to introduce is Friedel Dicker Brandeis. Friedel was an Austrian artist who was a member of the Bauhaus artistic community. The Bauhaus school in Germany combined crafts and the fine arts. 
It thought artistic design should not only be a part of the architecture and the fine arts, but it should include everyday items such as ceramics and glassware and furniture and even appliances. Friedel, like Otto Dix and Max Beckman, was a nationalist who decided that nationalism, rather than loyalty and reverence, meant love of country. To the point that if the leadership of one's country acts against certain universal values, then one could oppose such leadership. It was a belief that would exact from her a great, great price. Beginning in the early 1930s, Friedel Dicker Brandeis began producing anti-Nazi propaganda art. Here is a photo montage. The German words above read, this is what it looks like, my child, this world. That is what you have been born into. There are those born to shear and those born to be shorn. That, my child, is what it looks like in this world of ours and that of other countries. And if you, my child, do not like it, then you will just have to change it. Friedel experienced frightening interrogations by the Nazis against herself and against many people she knew, including children who were threatened if they did not give up information about their parents and relatives. In 1942, Friedel was deported to the Terezan Ghetto. This was a propaganda neighborhood located in Czechoslovakia, occupied Czechoslovakia, a neighborhood the Nazis used to show they were not suppressing Jews and other minorities. Representatives of the Red Cross were invited in after the residents had temporarily been provided with some creature comforts to see that Jews were not oppressed. The Nazi leadership wanted to show the outside world that although assigned to ghettos, Jews and other minorities were receiving a good education and a chicken in every pot. Well, at least until the Red Cross returned home. It was in the Terezan ghetto that Friedel used her artistic background to provide her greatest artistic service. There she organized theater performances and art classes for children, trying to create some structure and comfort for the youngest in the camp. The most famous of these theater performances was Brundabar. Brundabar is a children's opera that was performed 55 times from its premiere in Terezan Ghetto on September 23rd, 1943 to its last performance in October of 1944, when many of the children were deported to Auschwitz. The plot summary I pulled from Wikipedia and it goes like this. Aninka, or Annette in English, and Pepitschek, or Little Joe, are a fatherless sister and brother. Their mother is ill, and the doctor tells them she needs milk to recover, but they have no money. They decide to sing in the marketplace to raise the needed money, but the evil organ grinder, Brundabar, chases them away. However, with the help of a fearless sparrow, a keen cat, and a wise dog, and the children of the town, they are able to chase Brundabar away and sing in the market square. The story quickly came to be interpreted as an anti-Nazi protest with Brundabar representing Adolf Hitler. Friedel's greatest works of art were not her own paintings and photo montages, but the art of the children that she taught in the ghetto. The art was a kind of therapy for the children. It served 
to normalize their lives during a very abnormal existence. These artworks have been exhibited frequently and together with the context of their creation in mind, they serve as a powerful warning against a nationalism grounded in loyalty to the state, rather than a nationalism rooted in higher ideals that serve a wider humanity. It's the image of the butterflies on the right that I find most poignant, that really hits me the hardest. Butterflies for me symbolize both the ephemeral, ephemeral excuse me, beauty of life and the desire for but tentative nature of freedom. Friedel Dicker Brandeis was taken from Terrazan Ghetto in 1944 and murdered in Auschwitz on the 9th of October. And sadly, many of the children who were her students met the same fate. But before Frida was taken, she secretly stored the children's artwork in two suitcases, which were recovered. And that is why we have them to see today. What we have seen this morning are different perspectives on what nationalism is. Some artists have seen the nationalistic spirit as involving a reverence for and loyalty to charismatic leaders. But many other artists have felt nationalism is about challenging the state to reflect higher ideals that serve all its citizens and even serve people of other nations. What is your concept of nationalism? In this increasingly global community where technology has made borders more porous, almost invisible, where all of us living on this planet are more connected and interdependent, is there even a place for nationalism anymore as a personal value? Where do you lie? in this debate. Well, thank you for joining me this morning. This time, I'll go ahead and open it up to the floor. You're free to ask your questions or to make comments. Don't forget to unmute yourself and then when you're finished, mute yourself back.